where my second sort of um, half was about how we use these principles to build these quantum materials, what specific systems we can get, you know, what fantastic results, da 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 da. Uh, but this is specifically about how do we synthesize and create quantum materials. Okay, so, and uh, as you can see here, I'll just tell you a few things. And most importantly, I'll pick on, on, on uh, Paul's uh, sort of uh, paradigm about designing materials. Yes, you can design materials as long as you use them in ultra-thin form. Okay, so if you want to really just sort of follow like in much more detail, we wrote like several a few years ago a colloquium in review modern physics basically looking at uh, the paradigm, what can you create, what, how you design basically phases uh, by using the, the machinery which I'm about to talk about. All right, so um, the question I'm going to answer at the very end, is there any like unseen universe hidden in the plane view? That's what it is, it's a planar view. So that's going to be my very last slide if we all survive. Okay, so uh, Paul had motto, which sort of involved the word larger and bigger and better. Um, uh, this is our motto in my lab. Uh, as a, I'm a physicist and more, I'm a very peculiar grower. I'm a spectroscopist. If you look at my PhD, you will learn a lot about cuprates from the spectroscopy point of view and nothing about growth. Uh, but I'm a spectroscopist who in my postdoc years, uh, out of desperation, uh, turned into the grower. Okay? So I was in the Max Planck uh, in Germany and uh, where uh, everything is extremely slow on, uh, on the postdoc light, uh, time scale, at least for me. So I decided to take the initiative and, and did it. Okay, so, but I hear, we, we carry, you know, all in our lab carry two hats. We are spectroscopists, we do a lot of synchrotron work, a lot of sk scattering absorption, mostly in soft x-rays. And, um, you know, it's a beautiful sense, you know, we grow and we d measure. If we just drop the sample and crash it, not a big deal, we go and grow another one. Okay, so this is the basically we think, because I'm a physicist, I'm not chemist, or, you know, by any means, what do we do? We, we, we're not really coming up like Paul could, just beautifully somehow envisioned seems to me like based on the handbooks and other intuition for many years how to do things. We're a physicist. We basically use some brute force methods and we just, you know, just do the things. And that's why I said we, 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 the voyage of discovery for us is just seek a new landscape but with new eyes but somewhere the landscape still exists and the chemist done some work and sort of follow that, right? Okay. So that's the door from my previous institution. I moved, it's been in 2016 as I moved to Rutgers. That's a real door, no Photoshop. And we, like you see, we, we just, that, that's, that's copyrighted. You know, oxides are us, okay? So can't use it. Uh, that, that's a real door, so. Um, okay, so that's my, again, uh, that's uh, some reincarnation of my group and uh, extremely talented people. And most of the time I'm a voice of what they, these personalities do. Um, so I want to say a few words. Why quantum materials? I'm not going to really just stick with that, but I'll give you some sort of like essence. What, what to me is a quantum material? First of all, uh, you know, you, you should ask yourself, is there a non-quantum material? So it's a joke, right? Like everything is governed by Schrodinger equation and as such it is quantum, right? If you find one non-quantum material, let me know. I'm going to get the Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> Uh, but in reality, you know, why is it buzzword again? And to me, uh, it's again sort of a resynthesis of two paradigms. What, what uh, uh, Phil Anderson was, was telling us, emergence, emergence, emergence. And I think that's what it is. It's bringing the idea of emergence into the domain of materials. And I, I found a really good uh, sort of um, way to illustrate it. It's not my idea by any means. It's a, I think it's Pierce Coleman's idea. It's just to put the number of uh, compounds you can get out of you know periodic table having one element, two elements, three elements in your compound, and then looking what can you get. Uh, so this is not our domain. That's the most boring thing. This is the A and M, right? So this is where they, they you know strive and they're happy about that. They, no, there is no emergent phenomena. This is gas, right? So um, we need to go a, a step further. So it's a single element. So what are you going to do? The bar, there I bought uh, 100 compounds, uh, which sort of would condense, and immediately after that you get beautiful phases. Like you can get superconductivity, right? Immediately in lead, right? That was the poster boy material for that. So fantastic. So it's condensed and something happens right away. We go into two, you know, like about uh, 100 in the power of two uh, materials, uh, uh, binaries, and look at the uh, gallium arsenide, it's a fantastic thing. You know, you can really get the skirmians, you get fractional quantum hall effects, and so on and so forth. Okay, you go to three, 
It's just some things I'm picking randomly. You know, heavy fermions, you know, like three elements, you know, uranium, palladium, aluminum, boom. All of a sudden, absolutely new phenomena pops out, right? Heavy fermions, spin, spin, spin charge uh, separation, condo physics there. Very, very rich. No, I can't stop without that, you know, that has to show. Uh, uh, that, that's, uh, th look at how many compounds can we really have with that? They're all not sort of like being explored, like very just touched, right, and randomly things. And there are fantastic things we still cannot completely understand. What does it mean, this high temperature superconductivity? So that's, to me, the, the idea of emergence in the solid state material. And that's why we, we want quantum material. So the question is, how to get this? And I was listening very carefully what Paul Kahnfeld tried to tell us. I was listening to what, what Sang was trying to say, and John. And I tried to get the essence. Well, how you guys do it in the bulk? Let me tell you my story. How do I design materials? In, in, in films. Jack, uh, one yeah. exception I would note on this slide. Yeah, yeah there's a set, it's not my, my idea, so I, I, all questions that, to Pierce. That, that okay. First yeah. Element, yes. Element, yeah. Plutonium. But in the gas phase? No, this is assume it's gas. Solid. Yeah, uh, solid. Yeah, sure, sure. It's the same like lead, oh, right? Okay, yeah, I meant gas, right? It's non condensed, right? It's, it's, it's really a singular object, right? So without condensation. So there is no, yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, the, the elementary materials, the periodic table is extremely rich, right? <laughs> um, okay, so what, what to me, uh, how we design materials? It's actually not very difficult. If you just remember one simple thing, what is the new phase, right? And you go to your university course at a high school, you know, whenever you started, and you know, like, <clears throat> the easiest way to get to the new phase is to break a symmetry. You really have to, you know, like wherever you say just, it's a Landau paradigm. There is nothing really just, we've been living under the shadow of Landau for maybe half a century by now. Everybody knows once you break the symmetry, so you're missing some symmetry elements of the group, right? You immediately expect the new phase, the new phenomena should pop out, right? Okay, so we all know that. Um, that's sort of a reminder for people, just for students most of the time. So that's basically the idea. And... Um, and to me, this is the key, because if you do that, if you assume the control over the symmetry breaking process, right? If you could control that thing, that's automatically to you means that you can design the new phase. So if you know how to break inversion symmetry, right? And, and you have all the other elements right, you can expect the fair electricity or, or kind of power electricity or kind of uh, process will occur, right? And so on and so forth. There is, so the symmetry is an extremely powerful thing, you know, to remember. Okay, so how do we do that? That's the most important question to me, right? Um, so I'd like to say that this is my view. Again, we have not seen each other. It's the, you know, and I was sort of repeating the same thing. Uh, to me, this is what's the important thing. If, if you cannot, if you have a phenomenon and it can describe to me in an atomic level with some interactions, right? It means that there is no real understanding. It's phenomenological things. We hide it under this word, the things that it's a modern day alchemy. Really, that's what it is. As a result, you know, like uh, I, I, I tried it for the past 10 years, uh, working with very talented theorists that tried to convince people to fund these things, uh, including DOE. We had several workshops. Uh, that thing nobody wants to do. It's extremely, extremely difficult thing. How to predict from atomic, you know, from atomic interactions and new phases? How do nucleation occur? Even to understand the simplest process of nucleations, really realistically in the real materials, not like, you know, textbook thermodynamics. It's not really well understood. Uh, and as a result, I say every new trivial non-material may require months and years of extending alchemy. It's not that simple. Sometimes it takes decades of hard work, as we know in the gallium arsenide, you know, gas, all gas systems, you know, to, to, to perfect something, right? And it's based on, you know, people ask how you do it. Actually, it's based on this, your intuition, the amount of systems you grew before, okay, and very often on your luck. I'll, uh, you know, I'll give an example. Last year we published a result where the windows of growth was 20 degrees. How you hit this 20 degrees at particular pressure? I don't know. Somebody was lucky, you know, like because you can't grow, grow like millions of materials, explore every 10 degrees, right? So that that's what it is. Okay, so here's the example of a uh, beautiful example of what I call irrational materials design, okay? So this is a real picture, 1963, I collect Life magazines. Uh, so that's how I discovered this beautiful photo. And this is the real thing. It's a, it's a headline from this article. It says, 5,000 tries for the key chemicals. 
uh, to produce the first most important multilayer. Guess what it is? You would never guess, but we all use that perhaps at some point. That's a famous Polaroid film. This, this is exactly for, it's an article from the same magazine. Look at how many. They, they tried this to produce this beautiful heterostructure. Okay. So uh, that's what I call the irrational approach. We can't do that, right? Though you can make billions, perhaps, out of that. OK, so that came on the, as a cover of Scientific American in 2015. And I really I like, like that. You know, it says, from randomly discovered phenomena to collective quantum phenomena by design. That, that's, that's the best. OK, so we all know what we want to do. We want to break symmetries. How are we going to do it? The easiest way to do it is to follow this. So I put this headline here, interface as a symmetry breaker. OK, so this is what's in the bulk to me. Again, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure there are much more. It's just a, a, a thin film person looking at the crystals. And that's what I can do. This is your control parameters. OK, that's your control space. Uh, the polymers is a different lattices from the same chemical compositions. Um, but uh, we can do similar things here. Except there is an extension to this uh, control parameter space, uh, which will include um, design a lot of symmetries. And the Seng asked the question, I'd like to get triagonals, uh, you know, uh, lattice that I do you know. Actually, I do. I can actually design them. I do. We can make it. Okay? You may not like what we're going to make, but it's, it's not very difficult. Okay? And I'll show you how to. So, of course, there is a things which you never want to do it here. It's called quantum confinement because we can squeeze our things to, to basically to atomic plane. Okay? So if you look at the Daryl, I'm pretty sure Daryl Shlom showed some examples uh, how he can do it with oxide MBE, he can do it to the atomic layers. You know, we can squeeze uh, to, to monolayer really routinely. Okay? To one monolayer, it's routine. Uh, and, of course, uh, what uh, interface, not the surface. Again, I'm strengthening the interface. Surface is everywhere. Of course, bulk crystals, they have it too. But the surface interfaces, that's where the action will be. So those three things. By the way, interrupt me anywhere you want. You know, like, just don't wait till the end. So I want to just illustrate to me what, how it looks. So this is the bulk crystal, basically. It's a doped bulk crystal. It gives you some wonderful physics, like CMR or, or superconductivity, high TC, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can do the same thing, but what's called the ordered alloys, they're called digital alloys, extremely popular game for the past 10 years. So what you do, you basically replace the doping, random doping, by basically uh, producing uh, what you expect. Of course, there, you know, if, the, if the charge of this uh, ion here, say 3+, plus, and this is 2+, plus, uh, what you can do, you can create the ordered interface of 3 pluses and 2 pluses and then expect some chemical potential will equalize this charge, and so it will be transfer of charge. And as long as you've got three atomic planes, you can imagine there will be charge distribution, but without chemical disorder. Okay? So the question is you can answer, what is the CMR effect if there is no chemical disorder? Like for people who are aficionados of this business, you know, for example, you've got lantern manganide with strontium, right? That's a classic CMR material. What you can do here, you can lantern manganide, Layer, no doping, just the end member, and put strontium manganite end member here. And again, lanthanum manganite, strontium manganite, it creates the same composition. Like, for example, one unit cell here and one unit cell there will give you 50% doping. You can actually reach dramatic, gigantic doping, which you, you know, it takes forever for you to, to, to do it in the crystals. Here, you could do it just easily, in no disorder. Okay? And to simple answer, by the way, TC goes up by about 70 Kelvin when the disorder has been removed. And just you know, to, to let you know, it, this game's been played. Okay? Uh, but to me, this is not it. It's still there is a bulk unit cell. Okay? So you see this guy's happy. It has a top and a bottom, which is like in the bulk. Right? So you're basically looking at a digital alloy, but, okay, but still a crystal. I want to play this game, because I want to break every possible symmetry okay, with, the, with this thing. So look at this. If you go move your eye this direction, there is no way, you, can even say, you cannot say what is the unit cell, what's the new definition here, right? So you just redefine your crystal because this ion, top and the bottom, it doesn't have anything bulk. So it's extremely uncomfortable environment for the, for, the, for the new crystal. And that's what I call the artificial quantum crystal. Okay, so that's why I put it here, something to entertain you before we go into series. I call it this oxide interfaces. That's a real poster. Uh, and, and it's frightening, funny, profound, and mysterious. Okay. All right. Um, 
but more seriously, uh, this is one of the examples we've been working on that sort of gave us like a very interesting insight uh, into this game. We, we, we combined the uh, high tc cuprate with the CMR manganite and, uh, and, and expected some interesting physics to occur. So what do you expect? Well, watch this. Okay, so this is the uh, cuprate, which has an antiferromagnetic uh, plane, a copper two plane here. And this is your CMR manganite, right? You bring it here across the interface I mean, this is the first question you ask yourself, how this order, magnetic order, is going to get reconciled okay, across the interface. Okay. So the next thing, uh, because clearly this, this ion is not very comfortable with that ion, right? because exchange here and exchange there is very different, so that has to be some change. Uh, charge, if you look at the, for example, charge per atomic plane, you got this here, for example, NCMR plus, minus, plus, minus, then you get to the interface and it even cannot tell what's going on here. Because, I mean, you can count, for example, this yttrium layer is at 3 plus, but then you can't tell what's going on in the middle. Okay? There is a big charge redistribution, and if charge changes, then there is the built-in electric field, so it starts pushing ions. Okay? Um, the orbital thing is so my favorite game we've been playing for quite a while. Uh, we even introduced a new term called orbital reconstruction. So this is the orbital structure uh, in, the, in, the, in the cuprate versus orbital structure in the manganite. Uh, going from this to that, how do they couple? And if they do, because it's a chemical element, right? The material is being grown, right? So it means the chemical bonding occurs. So then the bonds are there, the orbitals are there. So, but how do they couple now? Okay, it's not like it's just a picture. Okay, and uh, this is a real chemical map. This is the cross-sectional TEM. It's a e with superimposed with eels, and you can see it. Actually, this is the interface. You know, they, they as as they should have been. They are atomically sharp. Um, if, if, if you do it right. But if you look at the chemical environment inside versus the chemical environment at the interface, it's totally different, right? So it's a, it's even the chemistry, the, the covalent bonding and, and, and the charge is it's very, very different. Okay, so that gave us the idea that perhaps we can, if we start breaking the symmetries, we can hope to, to produce new quantum states. And, and, you know, as I said, the best example will be gallium arsenide gas, all gas system. That's the best example. You know, you created two DAG out of two insulators. Okay, one has been dubbed, okay, semiconductors, right? And, but the physics you get there are ginormous, like fractional quantum hole effect is the first topological thing ever produced, right? And, and so uh, this is the best example of why the interface is so important. Right? Okay. Uh, no, and that's what I'm going to paraphrase what uh, Herbert Kramer said in his Nobel lecture. He says the interface is the device. Uh, I want to just remain, uh, just change it and say so interface the new material, in fact. Okay. Okay, so enough for this motivational speaker thing. Okay, so now we're going to go to nitty gritty. So where the devil is in details as usual. Okay, so this is designer toolkit. Uh, what I want to say that, uh, first of all, why do films grow at all? Okay, let me just puzzle you ginormously. You just heard fantastic talk, and John was sort of hinting what's going to happen, but let me tell you. This is uh, what, you know, how typical, typically films grow, and I'm pretty sure you've seen this picture from one of these uh, film speakers. And so what do you do? Basically, you deliver some form of uh, physical vapor in whatever way you prefer, either by laser evaporation or either by opening your shutter, thermal beam, you know, like with the chemistry, anything you like. And then there are several processes occur here. I'm not going to just go through all of them. And what's important? Uh, if, if the more vapor deliver, the nucleation happens here, and you start sort of layering them <coughs> layer by layer like this, that's great. That's your dream. Okay? If it goes like this, this is called the island formation, and it means the further you go, the worse it gets. Basically, this is fantastic single crystal, oh, some nice crystal, but this is not the film. Uh, this is what you're aiming for. Okay? So uh, the question is now, why do films grow? And let me puzzle you, this is a paradox. This is the film, first of all, Europium Nicola 3, which was produced in the bulk at the temperature more than 1400 C, uh, pressure 100 bar, and the max absolutely record is 100 micron in size. Okay, this is what it is. Uh, this is uh, what we grow, Europium Nicola 3, at 6 to 700 C, at 10 to the minus 4 of bar, okay, and that's 5 by 5 millimeters. I mean, if you look at that, in a, if you look at any phase diagram for the stability of your phase, 
you know, you don't have to be groot. There is no such a thing. You know, it doesn't matter how you look. That is not there. And yet, this is a single, you know, it's a single crystal by any measurement, by XRD and things. So it's a fantastic single crystal. Five by five millimeters. How does it work? You, you I mean, it's a, it's a, hor a, a horrible message what I just told you. No wonderful handbook, either in, in the book format or digital format, they're not going to help you. Because there is no help anymore. You grew so way outside of the stability of your phase diagram, then it clearly is something is wrong, or something is not what you think it is. OK, so uh, the, the answer to this uh, can, uh, was figured out actually not far, you know, like about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, first of all, there is no mystery. This is the same material I'm showing here, like a prosodymium nicolate, which you grow, which you grow very, very thick. So basically, it's a bulk thing. It knows nothing about that as a thin film. You know, it's really thick. It's a micron size. It's a real crystal, OK? But I grow it at 700 C and at that low pressure. Then I will look at the TM, and voila. Of course, there is no mystery. It decomposes. Why? Because it's outside of the stability phase diagram. It's, it is decomposing. There is no mystery. But the mystery remains, why do I have a single crystal? OK? So th the answer to this um, comes from this wonderful theory. As it was developed in the Moscow State University in 2000, early 2000, um, in the chemistry department. They look at the, what's the, the, call, the, coin, the terms called epitaxial stabilization. So basically, uh, you know, I, I'll do a very, very simple thing. I'll just uh, um, focus your attention on a couple of things. This is what I'm comparing. If you grow your thin film in the coherent way, in other words, atom on atom, versus incoherent. So in other words, if they're very thick, it has no notion of the substrate, so it's relaxed film. Okay? So it's like a crystal, basically, now. And you compare it with all the energy of that, uh, then you will notice that the difference between this, it's called incommensurate interface, versus the commensurate, that's your dream, it's a good film, which is atom and atom. That's basically what you will see here. There are two competing terms here, and this is your strain. This is the strain value here. It depends on the pose and ratio, of course. Um, that you will notice all of a sudden that your surface energy, that's what basically precludes the growth of the new phase. You see this surface, surface energy, surface tension energy, is extremely, extremely low in terms of the commensurate phase. Okay? And plus, of course, you got help, the energy contribution from the strain. But we heard it from John, right? So he was telling us PW term, P delta W, matters. Remember, in the Gibbs energy, P delta W matters. Okay? That's your P de delta W. But also, there is a, this thing, which is missing, of course, in the, in the bulk work. It's the how commensurate your interface versus uncommensurate, which is in the bulk crystal. And as such, uh, the conclusion is simple. And that's the very fact that you grow atom and atom gives you this extra contribution, which lowers dramatically your surface tension energy and enables the nucleation of the new phase. And of course, this term is equivalent, I mean, visually equivalent of pressure. You know, the strain that, that the elastic distortion you impose on the lattice, right, is, is similar to that. Okay? So, okay. Um, I'm going to skip on that because John basically t told you a lot of things about that uh, in the previous talk. That the, the epitaxial stabilization, really what it does, it reduces your chemical potential and you decreases the thermodynamic activity, uh, you know, tendency towards decomposition, and it reduces the reactivity. For, okay, for example, uh, if you get the perovskite phase, for example, this thing is shifted to the left. Okay, so then it, it, it would not decompose as easily at given uh, partial pressure. Um, for the films, however, it also possess, uh, poses some very strange problem. Let's say we grew some interesting new film, and uh, the statement what we just about uh, to learn, uh, we, we grew at some particular pressure and uh, temperature and compare it to the bulk, because you have to compare it to some physical properties of the bulk crystal. But we just learned that because this phase diagram is now shifted, it's not very clear you lost your chemistry, uh, typically oxygen content, or you just got some fantastic interesting physics, which is like confinement, symmetry breakings, charge transfer, da-da-da-da, you can publish wonderful paper. 
or you just have dealing with the boring chemistry. Okay? Uh, that part, actually, the answer is nobody knows. Okay? So we cannot measure oxygen content in ultra-thin films yet. And I even don't know who will ever come up with anything better, better than, say, percent. Cannot. Okay? There is no really in the world method. We use the best one. We use the soft X-ray absorption on oxygen edge. But that gives you really like a percent. That's your absolute limit. Okay. Um, okay. So we start with the substrate. Uh, unlike things you learned so far, this is the most important thing. If you want to grow one unit cell things, you better start with atomically flat things. Oxygens, they don't come up atomically flat. What you get, they are polished single crystal substrate. They really mechanically polished. Okay. So what you get in, what you bind is this. It has two problems. The first problem is the roughness of the surface. Clearly, you cannot grow a unit cell like on this crystal. And the second problem, the chemical composition of the surface is very, very different from what you expect because it's a mixed chemical composition. So once you deposit your material, you basically get a you know, mixture. The nucleation on this surface is not going to be uniform. Okay, so what you have to start with, and this is the hardest part, you start with that, how do you prepare atomical flat surface? You wouldn't believe it. That problem was so important. How to chemically etch the surface of strontium titanate that was published in Nature. Seriously, it was an article published in Nature by Kawasaki and the group, okay? <laughs> which, which is nothing more and nothing else as the how to use hydrofluoric acid, buffered hydrofluoric acid, to etch strontium titanate to produce atomically flat surface. And that's the procedure they developed. So the whole world jumped into that and become using this, what's called the Kawasaki's procedure to produce it. And this is our result. For example, grow one unit cell thin films, you know, and they're extremely beautiful. This is steps, which is just one unit cell height. You can see here 0.39 nanometers when you scan across. And this is the three micron by three micron image. So it's, it's just gigantic. We get f steps of one unit cell on a three by three micron. Okay, that's, that's sort of the things you can push. But unfortunately, what people did not notice, um, and uh, we initiated, we spent almost two years of my um, um, first, uh, when say, during the faculty, is redoing, reinventing, and we called it Arkansas procedure, uh, actually, we went in literature as an Arkansas procedure. Should we coin now, Rutgers? Um, and where we basically produce the same roughness. This is our result. This is what Kawasaki's procedure. But let me show to you what Kawasaki did. And, and I mean, Kawasaki's procedure does two films. So if you go and measure photoluminescence, which basically measures the number of defects on your substrate once you apply hydrofluoric acid to it, then this is what Kawasaki procedure does. Okay? This is what we invented. And actually, it's multiplied, divided by three, this whole thing, because the adder, you know, if we put it on a real scale, it's going to be a tiny blob here. Okay? So what happens there, the, this procedure, the whole way, you know, the whole world is embracing this sort of a roughness and beautiful, smooth films. But electronically, they're extremely defective. They produce tons of electronic defects. And it shines, you know. It's photoluminescence. Basically, those are vacancies. So we reinvented the way, like, basically, to dramatically lower these uh, defects. Um, the next thing I want to show to you, this is not a simulation. This is somebody's two years of life of a student. It's seriously a thing. The person built an uh, atomic force microscope head into the growth machine, I'm not joking, into the growth machine, and they will do one shot, okay, with the laser pump. Uh, you, you know, they, I'm not saying, it's a pulse laser, depending, I'll explain how it works, but it's a one shot, materials delivered in one shot, they move the head, and it's in 700C. The head is operating in 700C. It scans it, then they do another shot, the scan moves out, moves in, moves out, and they make a movie. That's actually how films grow.
No comments required, OK? To me, it's a sign of insanity to do this project, but it's so beautiful. <laughs> you just enjoy a minute of somebody's two years of hard work. So okay. is that the uh, PhD prep defense? It's a, it's Show this video? Well, <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, on, on the bright side, that person received really beautiful job, you know, like in the industry. That guy really got fantastic job because he designed. He, he's a you know God's given engineer, right? So I mean, try to operate atomic force microscope head to put them in the same spot at 700 C. Believe me, it takes some you know like Netherlands kind of mind to. To, to do this kind of work. I, I was really admiring that thing. But there's really like a, one. So, OK. Now, let me just explain what's the power's laser jet position finally. How do we do it? Jack, before you go on, yeah. can you comment more on, on what we're seeing there? Like, for instance, the fact that it, it fills in before the next. Yeah, basically, it's, it's called layer by layer growth, right? So you basically, it really is layer by it's a, it, this is what how layer by layer growth is supposed to look like, right? So basically, it's a slow, very, because you can see the. But it's the, amazing that there's no other islands that's in the forest. No, no, they, they, there, is a, there, there is a high temperature. So what basically what happens is that the, the shot, maybe after this movie, you wouldn't ask me, OK? Allow me oh. to show you another movie. It's a real beautiful movie. <laughs> so how it works. And then I'll, if, if the question is still there, I'll explain how it works. Yeah, that was the layer by layer growth. Uh, I, by the way, I have a 3D growth also movie. They, they did it on purpose. In one of the, each shot you're saying? It's, it's a certain amount of material. Which what, you know, just a small snap point, about, It's about 0.3 angstrom has been delivered uh, randomly on, on, on the surface 5 by 5, but that's what you see. It's a small, you know, whatever the scan has. I have a full thesis, so if anybody wants to reproduce it. It's very easy. Uh, OK, let me say what, what's the uh, pulse laser deposition. Or it's a Japanese prefer to call it laser MB. So basically, uh, what, what is the uh, beauty of this technique? The beauty of this technique is you can put any background gas, gas for, for processing. It doesn't have to be oxygen. It could be, we try N2O, for example. We try argon. Uh, you know, if you're insane enough, you can reduce it with the hydrogen. I mean, that's a bomb. but. Uh, you can put any, any process gas if you'd like to in, in your system. So it really does it. The price for that, you have no support from phase diagram. Nobody ever will produce for you the phase diagram to rely on if you put argon or anything, right? Now, number two, we're not limited, unlike for, okay, I'm going to go to the simple device. Uh, unlike MBE, where you're really forced to operate in the, an ultra high vacuum because uh, basically, you open the shutter and you rely basically on thermal energy, right? It's a heater and you heat in your thing, and this is basically the, you move with the maximal distribution of your uh, atoms. Here, uh, the source is that is so energetic, in fact, you're dealing with the opposite problem, how to slow down the plume, okay? Because I will explain how it works, it's, but it's a cumulative process, right? It's basically, you know, it's like shooting the bomb and then, you know, okay, this is a simple thing. Imagine you got this, you know, the pile of sand. You take a rock and you just smack the rock into the pile of sand. And you will see there a lot of sand will go backwards. So it's like a cumulative process, right? So that's what you do. You shoot with the laser, you ablate the material, you break all the bones, and then it's sort of like a shock wave in the vacuum. You've got the, the plume or the ionized gas of the material you just shot into with the laser delivering. So it's the same idea, opening shutter or shooting with the laser, right? Except with the shutter, it's a thermal energy. Here you've got extremely, extremely energetic particles going backwards, right? Because it's basically a shock wave expanding. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The movie we just saw yeah. Was yeah, it's a single pulse and you see things grow. Yeah, the weight, the shoot, and then you, 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 you watch how they grow. So it, came down it, it comes down with the, um, what comes down the uh, word chunks assume some mi micro particles. Those are real it's plasma. plasma. It's a plasma. There's a molecules and ions, all sorts of ionization state. I'll show you actually exactly what's in the plume. I have this slide. It's a standard misconception. What is really flying in the plume? Okay, I have it. I have a real experiment. Okay. So another thing is, uh, so you can, you can actually just pump up your gas up to atmosphere. It doesn't matter. We don't, ha we don't need this ultra high vacuum at all. Now, what else is uh, you can grow materials absolutely in a ridiculous way from a slow thermodynamic growth where there's like, you know, like you guys do, like you wait days, hours, or typically in my lab, we grow one monolayer within 0.1 of a second. That's a growth rate, okay? So, and, and clearly that growth is kinetic. 
Okay, it has nothing to do with thermal, thermodynamics as you expect it normally. It's really like uh, kinetic theory in action. Uh, we have uh, in situ read control, but uh, also you can all, uh, you know, heat up your substrate to, we, we've, in our system we got this uh, IR laser, uh, very similar basically what Seng has for his uh, floating zone, it's, but uh, it, it runs only 21500C. That's the same IR laser. So we can do various you know, regimes. We can actually put sine function and it will modulate in temperature as a sine function if you wish to. All crazy things. You can crack your substrates in the seconds if you want to. You can just turn it off and everything will shudder. So all sort of things. Uh, uh, by the way, somebody asked about lifespan. I don't know about this high temperatures. Our lifespan, we run to 1500. It's been on since 2012, almost daily, except for the last year when we moved from Arkansas. So, that's uh, about sort of the answer. It's the, by the way, the first one in the US we put together this German, you know, basic IR thing, um, laser, and uh, it costs 60,000. If it, something happens to it, that's a big deal, you know? It's not cheap. Okay. okay. But that's of course the laser, the other one is continuous. Yeah, uh, no, no, our is continuous. Oh, yeah, it's a heater. We're just heating on the oh, back. I mean the, the heater. The heater is continuous. No, this is UV. No, I'm talking about we heating substrate to 1500C by using laser. Not only we produce plume with the laser, but we also have this all tools, right? Now, how does it work? Okay, let me show it to you. I'll be commenting. What? Movie time. So, um, ah, sorry about that. Movie time. Listen to me, I will be watching this. So those are the targets. This is the material sitting. This is the laser shooting. Okay, see? Pulse, plume. Change the things, pulse, but I have six of them in the carousel. So I can grow multi-layer with six different materials in any combination I like. Now, this is in situ read. This is electron diffractometer operating in the reflectivity mode constantly. It's DC. It's always there. It's a surface reflect, uh, reflectivity mode. Okay? So what we see is basically the top one or two, three angstrom of the surface, how the crystal looks. Actually, it's a real picture. That's how it looks like. You know, this is surface diffraction. And uh, it's perfect diffraction because substrate is perfect, right? It's single crystal. Now we start shooting. See? Shot. Let's say I produce one monolayer of this. And then my intensity went up. Okay? So if I covered one monolayer, the intensity went up. If the monolayer is not complete, the intensity goes down. This, what you do is just basically count the number of uh, this uh, wiggles up, down, up, down. So if it's not clear, I'll repeat one more time. So the read is a very simple thing. Imagine you have a mirror. Okay, it's for students. You have a mirror, and we just shine in regular light, flashlight, right? And this is my detector on my eye. Now I start sprinkling dust on that, right? just constantly. So the more dust, you know, the dust covers, say, for example, 30% of the, of the mirror. The reflectivity goes down, right? Because dust randomly diffuse scatter things. Then we cover 50% of the surface randomly. Now you don't know, is it good or bad? That's actually very bad because you don't have the original surface, but the new layer is still 50%. So it's like worse situation. So the, the intensity of the reflected light is basically at the bottom right here. And then you put more dust, new, new layer, the new material keeps growing, 60%, 70%, 80%, so 100%, right? And that's a new layer. It's like a new mirror. The intensity, boom, shoots up, right? Why doesn't it have more um, This is a very special, and I'll say it, this is the not what you used to. This is what not you absolutely good observation. This is because the growth here is ginormously fast. It's enormously fast. So what you used to is really thermodynamic growth. That when the new phase, basically nucleates slow, and that's what you will see the intensity. Here, here we deliver material basically within. Uh, we shoot 60 hertz, so it's a 60 pulses per second. So um, what happens? And I'm going to show it to you, like in the next slide, what happens here. This is the new mode we discover of the growth. This has nothing to do with thermodynamics. It's really highly kinetic growth. That's the only way to stabilize this unusual new materials, okay? So uh, I know with the MBE regular thing, you cannot do it, right? Like, I mean, you, get, you open your shutter, you're done, right? So if people used to put some choppers in that. I know like in France, they put an MBE, you put choppers to chop the flux, but that's very scary, okay? So uh, this is what it is. Imagine you put in your, uh, you know, you, 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 open, you, you open your shutter and now you chop it. 
And so here we chop the flux, but about 60 hertz. Okay. So uh, that's, that's why uh, this is the new mode of growth. So the, the thing grows, but not thermodynamically. I don't know. Should I answer uh, the question, what you tried to ask, or you already forgot all of them? <laughs> is it 3D growth, 2D growth? OK, this, this is what, what we see, you know, basically. Okay, yeah. So this is a highly kinetic growth. It's, it's not possible. No, because you don't have a way to, to, I mean, you can force your flux to go faster, right? I mean, there's only degree how much you can heat it. Right. So it's actually a kind of continuation of Eric's uh, question as well as it is Lorenz's question. So the previous two cartoon uh, video, the cartoon real video, uh, to me it looked like uh, there is a fundamental unit, some kind of cluster. And rather than cluster growth, it's more cluster, same size, more cluster comets, and then eventually they fuse together, become one monolith. That was my impression. Yes, and yes. There is a something called uh, edge. Growth. Yes, it's step flow. It's called step flow. So step it's not step flow. So it's not step flow growth. This is not step flow, what you see. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's easy to explain. Uh, it's a very good question. So it's about more of the month of growth. I sort of skipped on that because I thought maybe one of my colleagues already addressed that. So uh, the, the, the step flow is a very beautiful growth. Unfortunately, a reed is useless for that. Reed will be blank. And this is one of the dangers. You know, in a step flow, you imagine you have steps, you know, the, the, the I don't know, you could, you could imagine the real steps, right? So you go, you know, and then you stay on the very top and you take a bucket of water, okay? And then you start pouring your water from the very top. It's really not, I'm not saying anything else. This is exactly what you will see. I have the same work done by the strontium ruthenate. Strontium ruthenate, you know, a tree grows exactly as the step flow. And it, what you will see, your material start flowing. It's really floating on, the, or, you know, from step to step because the surface is always visceral, right? You cannot produce, you know, macroscopically large surface which is atomically flat. There is always one step, you know, the unit cell basically steps or two unit cell steps. It, we call them terraces, right? And so what that does, once you deliver material, material starts floating from step to step, basically filling up. Well, it doesn't just start from the top. It no, no, I'm just giving the water example. The yeah, yeah, I'm just giving the water example, right? Yeah, so it, it, it really goes like this, you know, the water analogy just to help to imagine. Uh, with this thing, it's, it's a regular thing. It's basically it's absorption, desorption, and nucleation. So basically, once you create the critical size of nucleus, right, there is an island, and, you, and you know, more material is delivered. And basically what it does, the desorption is high here, but however, this atoms, because of the therm temperature, right, that comes in and basically gets stuck in the island. Okay? That's, that's very fast process. It's micro, microscopic sort of view. And the island grows, but that's a very, very fast process. This uh, AFM doesn't see it that way. AFM is like infinite, infinite time compared to that. So what you see is basically uh, a, a microscopic view where many islands already, large size, you know, they're really like already, you know, tens of nanometers or maybe larger. Uh, they just basically come together and nucleate and grow. Because uh, once you bypass the critical size, right, the phase wants to grow. And the larger things, the surface tension, right, to the new phase is getting smaller and smaller. The larger new phase, the quicker it grows. Yeah, but compared to your very first element of uh, discussion, uh, so this is uh, kind of a coherent island growth. In the sense that one island, the next. Yeah, so the, the, the yeah. Edge flow is better. Edge flow is much better. But I can't see it in read. Because once the material starts floating, it floats really. It's really water floats on the thing. To me, read looks blank. There is nothing in there. Reed, in fact, read will show there is very bad growth. I lost all these oscillations. There is no yeah, covering. The other way, no, uh, not with read. Anyway, so yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I, I don't know. I have not looked at that. Uh, is there any other ways to look at that? Read is de facto a standard tool for that. Yeah, so, yes. Oh, what, no, no, you promised three hours, no? 
Okay, so uh, let uh, okay maybe I'll skip some parts, but uh, this is the answer. What uh, so there is a huge misconcept, right? So people just claim in the books, really in the books, what you do, you take your material from your target and you transfer chemistry, stoichiometry. To the, this is completely wrong. This is completely wrong. Believe me, you're gonna see now your barrier and the eye. This is misconcept. This is wrong, really. Um, so first of all. Uh, how fast is the particles going there? I'll skip on that. But it shows if you don't put any process gas in a vacuum, it's about 70 EV. It's a real experimental work. Uh, so people shot. This is your target. The plume gets uh, here. It expands because it's a shock wave. This is time. Basically, it's your movie. And this is your substrate here. So this is by substrate. So if you put just 10 to the minus 2 millibar of the gas, look at this. Because of the huge exchange, you know, imagine yourself, your plume is propagating and start exchanging because there's a process gas. There's a lot of inelastic process which slows down things, producing all possible excitation states of ions, all possible. And that slows down. And if you work in oxygen, you will never, ever need atomic oxygen. Like, you know, people in MBE, they're so proud they spent half a million and produced atomic MBE. Uh, you know, the, the, the oxygen is atomic uh, oxygen. It's really half a million. You don't need it. You have it just by for free because of this exchange. Your oxygen goes from 2 minus, right? So to the O minus, O star, all possible oxidation states of oxygen. You would never imagine. But of course, dynamically. So it's extremely aggressive oxygen compared to anything else. So your process gases are extremely aggressive compared to, but of course, they're uncontrolled. But they're very, very different. Um, OK, so this is number one. Number two, uh, how much plume you can get. You can actually thermalize it absolutely like MB. You can deliver them. With the energy, it's absolutely like in an MB process when you put that much oxygen, for example. There's 10 to the minus 1, there's 1 1.2 millibar. And this is your 10 to minus 2. So, see, that's your plume at the target. In fact, it doesn't even touch it. Okay? So it is soft lens, absolutely. There is no damage or anything like that. Okay, let me show to you that the, the stoichiometric transfer is a jog. Uh, this is the manganite, your favorite. Uh, London and Barry Manganese so 3. Uh, what you will look in here is basically chemistry uh, for different pressure in the chamber. And this is your uh, various wavelength. And uh, basically, we just monitor as a function of time. This is different snapshots moving. And substrate is here, target is there. OK? As you can see here, I just identified it here. That's what fits on the plume. If somebody tells you, you do stoichiometric transfer, it's a joke. You actually do a real chemistry, and the chemistry is awful because this, no phase diagram exists for this. This is what really happens in the PLD process. Okay? So what you do, it's in the past, they would call it a molecular plus ion beam epitaxy. That's what it is. It's not stoichiometric transfer or anything. It's really in the textbooks. I even don't know where it's coming from. Of course, this work is pretty new. It's about 10, 000, uh, 2010. Uh, but uh, still, uh, it's a real chemistry synthesis, okay? It's a synthesis machine. Okay, I'm going to skip on that. Um, this shows uh, the answer to your question, Lauren. So uh, why the uh, read looks so strange? This is what people do when they do like standard PLD. This is what we invented, okay? So uh, what people do, you do shot, Deliver a material, and here's your nucleation. Something happens on the surface. Shot, material delivered, relaxation, nucleation. And that's where you see this up, down, up, down, the nucleation. You know, you got oscillation sine, sine wave like. Okay? Now you can imagine yourself what happens if I start, you know, basically that was our idea. So what happens if I bring those things close? I wouldn't allow it to, 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 to relax. You could imagine like this, or in extreme, like that. You shot it so fast, there is no nucleation, right? So you really pump your supercritical vapor on the surface. You really pump it. And then you go to what we call the MBE-like continued flux, because it doesn't relax. You just really pump it and let the gas sit in there. But that's in the supercritical condition now. Okay? So you would say, why would you want to play with these things? And let me show to you what was our problem. This is London nickelate, by the way, which we routinely can grow, and there is no problem with that. Um, and unfortunately, it grows like this. And anybody who knows read, it means that you fall into the 3D growth. You see this read pattern, 3D-like transmission, TM-like. This is what it is. This is your surface in AFM. This is how your Q space looks like that we see it in real time that we got 3D growth, the junk. Okay. 
no, I do nothing. I don't touch anything except I'm going to crank dramatically, but uh, six times faster delivering the vapor to the surface. Okay, boom. Look at this. It's actually improving over the time. Again, you see that, of course, it's a, it's a little bit strange pattern, right? Uh, partially, it comes from the fact we don't have read enough to pick up with this, you know, like there is, you understand the technique, right? So there is all, so much information going, so the, even the fiber optic doesn't allow us to catch every point. So we don't have enough points uh, to plot it. So it may look a little bit strange, but it also intrinsically dynamics is very different. But the result, look at the 70 picometer roughness on the surface. Beautiful, you know, your read pattern is fantastic and, and you know, crystalline and everything is there. And uh, that's what we see. Uh, basically, this is how the growth occurs when I blow it up. That's basically what it's not sign like pattern, but that's, that's how it works. Okay? So we even did this in situ um, uh, imaging, so just to see how these different parts of the growth occur, but that's sort of a separate story. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to say a few things. So what do we have in our lab? We have now three machines, uh, all state-of-the-art. Um, they, they have in-situ photoelectron tools. Uh, we can do Auger, EELS, and XPS. Um, of course, you have read. Uh, we also get XRF. It's a fluorescence monitor. We can see chemistry basic in real time. Uh, temperature is controlled by parameters. So the master, so in other words, we don't want to grow our films based on the information about temperature from the thermometer okay, on your heater. Because we found it's actually very dangerous information. In fact, we measured, and there is about, you know, if the film thick enough, about 100 degrees gradient across the film between the substrate and the surface. But we grow surface. We don't grow substrate. So what we've done, we put the parameter and the master in the control of the temperature is parameter. Now, you say, fantastic. Why nobody else is doing that? Let me tell you why is that the problem. Because who wants to go? and calibrate it. The temperature, you need to calibrate your every material you grow parameter, and that's not known. The epsilon for each material needs to be calibrated as a black body radiation. You need a box, and that's a very intense job. Okay? But we're done for selected materials, and that's really, it really just means a lot. Okay? And again, substrate could be CD here. So we have in our library uh, over 100 complex oxides. We can you know, do 3D, 4D, 5D. Heterojunctions, you know, that kind of things. Um, okay, I'm about to, let me select only one topic, which I'd like. So who wants to hear about either defects or strain? What's the strain and what's the defects? Defects, I think you all know. Strain. strain. The mystery. <laughs> what's a strain? Yes. So uh, this is, by the way, what about defects? If you want to impress uh, uh, someone who you like a lot, uh, go to, uh, to your lab and extract oxygen from strontium titanate and you tell it's a subfire. Uh, as long as the person is not a material scientist, you will be very, very impressed. So you'll get 5 by 5 millimeters, so 10 by, five mil 10, by 10 millimeters, a millimeter thick subfire for 100 bucks. But it will be most perfect subfire. Of course, it's not, right? But it will be as beautiful. It will be beautifully, you know, it's not. This thing? Or, I don't know. I haven't measured, but I've done it. It glows as, as you know, under X-rays, it glows as hell. <laughs> Beautiful blue color. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, people, no, people reported that it's magnetic, but as I said, I did XMCD and it doesn't show it. Okay? It's, it's, it's kind of, it's not very obvious. Could be. You know, I'm, I'm not sure what it is, right? But it's very easy to do. Okay, so as I promised, I'll, I will skip on that and allow me to... Uh, switch uh, to the strain. And I'll ask you a question. You've seen perhaps a million uh, works uh, where people say, oh, strain, uh, we apply strain and my material become this, my material become that. Um, this is one word, by the way, what we're proud of. How to make graphene. Who wants to hear how to make graphene? Very easy. How to make triangulars? Very easy. I'll show it to you how to do it. Take any cubic lattice, grow in the substrate, which is one, one, one cut. And you'll get beautiful, if you grow only two monolayers of, on any cubic structure, it gives you that. We've done it, we published it, there is a PRL 2017. Graphene-like materials are easy to make with correlations. 
okay? One one non-templated substrates. You can create anything. Think in terms of one one. Of course, bulk crystals cannot do it. I can't tell you, I said I can tell you how to, but you may not like it. Because, I mean, it's the question is what do you do with that? Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, I'm going to speak, skip on the polar catastrophe, okay? I'm pretty sure somebody told you about this. Um, uh, okay. As I said, unfortunately, this was a, a two-hour lecture I gave. And, uh, okay, what is strain, really? This is like a most ridiculous thing I, I hear all the time. Okay, we apply strain to my ABC film and you get new face. Why? Ah, because we apply strain. What is strain? Oh, but it's like, you know, it's a cube and it could be squeeze it, you squash it, you know, it moves up. It's a rubber piece, right? And you move that, that. This is absolutely wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. This is like not at all what it is. It has nothing to do with that. This world's called tetragonal distortion. Does not work like that. It doesn't exist, in fact. Okay? Never existed. I don't know where it came from. Maybe it's the simplest thing what theorists could do. Um, okay, so what's the, what's the strain, the classic thing? By the way, for you uh, who admire a few GPAs, uh, John Mitchell, for you, it's a 1% strain in Perovskite's 2 GPA. Uh, comes for free, a few dollars, you know, buy substrate, mismatch. Uh, I can do up to 3.8% mismatch, so I can reach maybe 10 GPA. <laughs> so. Of course, it's not the same, right? I'm just saying that it, it's really, if, if you want to know some numbers in perovskites, on average, and oxide perovskites, it's about two GPA as a percent. It's just a good number for you to remember, okay? Um, okay, so we can also do this thing. So the basic you have mismatch between the lattice uh, parameter here on the surface and the lattice parameter in AB plane. So then you have to match atom and atom because that's how we grow, and that's your basic mismatch parameter. It's in percents. Uh, so that's what it's called sometimes strain in literature. And it's positive, you know, uh, or negative, right? When you, you know, expand it, it's negative. So is it negative pressure? Can people call it negative pressure? Uh, no, it's not. Okay, it's again, very often in chemical pressure, people call negative pressure, you know, this negative, it's not, okay? It has nothing to do with that. Is that pressure, this GPA? No, it is not, okay? So uh, what it is, what, what is, what's most important is this. This thing is the most important thing, is the symmetry, okay? So if you look at this crystal and look at this crystal, what's most important when you bring two materials and you put them atom on atom is not how they basically align itself, which is, which is important, the bonds are different, da, 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 da. But this is, the question is how you align the symmetry of two lattices. This is what you dream. That's your imagination, in fact. See this material, this is your substrate, that's strontium titanate, I grew this material, and then you think there is a registry like that. That's basically your dream, okay? Another thing, ask yourself a simple question. Have you ever thought about that? If you have, like for example, hexagonal structure and you have a cubic underneath, can you match them? Can you put atom on atom? Oh, that's a very, no, exactly not. Uh, and in fact, if you, there, that game has been played by mathematicians, and in fact, it's very well known. If you have this symmetry, group symmetry and you have that group symmetry, if you bring them together, what can you grow? And it turned out you go to a lower symmetry, typically, if at all, if it's possible at all. If it's not possible, you ended up with a very defective structure. But if it's possible, you just created a brand new crystal because the symmetry will be adopted between those two layers is different. It's a new symmetry group. Okay, but it's not it. Uh, this is what symmetry is. L let me just show to you, imagine material has some structural units, okay? In the perovskite, there will be some octahedra. That's the simple thing. If you think you have octahedrium, imagine this sort of like things like this, right? Those octahedra, octahedra, and they connect it through some apical this atom here, right? There's like a hinge. And if you think, if I start squeezing now the structure and those bonds all of a sudden, because the bonds are just Coulomb interaction, nothing else, right? If you think those two charges start going closer to each other, you are highly mistaken because that costs a lot of energy to bring charges together. Coulomb energy is very expensive. But here you got a hinge. What do you do? You do squeeze, hinge goes like this, hinge goes like that, hinge goes like this. That's a phonon mode. The phonon mode is what is a few milli-electron volts, tens of milli-electrons at most, cheap. So what happens on this train 
the structure, this structural units will start basically, and remember, surface is free. It's a free end. So the structure, the whole this cube started rearranging itself in a way to accommodate all strain through the Z direction because it's a free end. Nothing is there. So the strain, it's the last thing when it affects your bonds and this and that. First, it will change the rotations and tilts of your structural units, whatever they are. Okay? That's the simple thing, number one. Number two, you say, okay, but we see interesting physics, right, on the strain of this and that. Where it comes from? This is where it comes from. The first thing you affect, of course, the bond angle. See, let's say you have two structural units. There is no extension, this and that. This is the bond angle. Your bandwidth is automatic. It's a simple Harrison formula, right? The bandwidth in this structure, so you have two transition metal ions and some ligand in between, then that's your bandwidth. So you change the bond angle, boom, your bandwidth is dramatically affected. That's number one what you change, right? Number two, the most important thing. Well, that's, that's not most, that's number three is gonna be the most important thing. So you, you change the magnetic state because remember in the super exchange, the bond angle matters. 90 degrees typically, it's an anti-far magnetic exchange in the super exchange theory by Anderson, right? 180 degrees is typically anti-far magnetic exchange. So by changing this bond angle between structural unit, you actually move between magnetic states. Anti-farming is say to farming. Oh, other things too, right? Whatever is a lot. And this is the most important thing. Very, very strangely, people overlook that. If you ever go to Ashcroft Marmot, and if you look at the, uh, your um, cohesive energies, what is the largest energy scale in the cohesive energy? The modulon energy. There is nothing what holds the crystal more than modulon, right? And modulon is just basically a coulomb, right? And think what you've just done. You have a, I'm illustrated by perovskite, but it really works uh, in other crystal structures quite well. So this is your ISI, that's a huge ion, that's a your rare earth. Right? It's a gigantic piece sitting there. This is your oxygen, and this is two transmission, uh, tra uh, transition metal ions. They're just basically so tiny, they go interstitial. It's a close pack structure. And, and so what do you do? You change the bond angle. You bring those atoms so close to the A side, right? Basically what you do, you just dramatically change modeling potential on those guys, hugely. And the modeling potential, why is it so important? Because if in any theory of any correlated electron, if you look at the, what is the energy gap? The first most important term in the energy gap is the modulon potential. The charge gap in correlated oxides is the modulon potential plus all sorts of corrections to that. By controlling this guy, right, bringing it close, you actually vary quite a bit of gap. And in fact, yeah, I'm just finishing up. You can close it. Okay, so uh, I, I, I just, as I promised, I delivered only one talk, and this is the answer to the first question. Is there any answer the universe hidden in the plain view? This is one of my favorite characters in the movies, and this is a real quote from Woody Allen. He said, there is no question there is unseen universe. The question is, how far is it from Midtown and how late it's open? Uh, for people living in New York and close to it, it matters something. Okay, thank you very much, I'm done.